Um, I'd like to say good morning to everyone. I'm uh, T.S. Akers, um, the only living uh, past Grand Captain General of Knights Templar of Oklahoma, and it's a uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be here with everyone this morning as we're going to hear a uh, a wonderful uh, presentation on um, the history of the uh, Knight Templar apron from Sir Knight uh, Carson C. Smith. Um, I'm particularly excited about this because. Uh, you know, Templary came to uh, to uh, the territories of the Twin Territories of Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory in the 1890s, and uh, we never adopted the the Templar apron for wear. So I, I'm very interested to uh, to understand the history of that uh, particular uh, article of regalia. So with that, I'll uh, I'll turn this over to to Carson, and let me first let me add um, we will be taking questions. Um, at the end of the presentation. However, there is a Q&A feature on Zoom, um, which will be at the bottom of your screen. If you could, um, please pose your questions in the, in the Q&A section, um, and uh, we will, we will um, take a look at those uh, at the end of the presentation. So, um, Carson, the floor is yours. Very good. Let me open the document. Very good. And if we've done our work correctly, you should be looking at my business card. Correct? Hello? Yes, 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 we see it. We're good. Perfect. Very good. This is the point of beginning. In the Symbolic Lodge, the newly initiated entered apprentice is presented with the lamb skin or white leather apron. It is an emblem of innocence and the badge of a Mason. But after men became Masons, they sought further light in Masonic orders of Christian knighthood, choosing to wear their own distinctive Knight Templar apron. So far as I know, and unless I am mistaken, pray the York Rite is the first and only body in the state of Indiana that has made the Knight Templar apron the subject of serious inquiry. By way of introduction, my primary motivation in becoming a Freemason was that I wanted to become a Knight Templar like my grandfather, Sir Knight Leonard Roy Land, pictured on the left, who was a member of Knightstown Commandery No. 9. My grandfather was presented with his 50-year award of gold by Sir Knight Willard Meredith Avery, pictured in the center, at Golden Rule Lodge No. 16 in Knightstown in 1958. Sir Knight Avery, who was a past commander of Knightstown Commandery No. 9, had already served as the 95th Grand Commander of the Grand Commandery of Indiana in 1956 and 57, and went on to become the 45th Grand Master of the Grand Encampment from 1976 to 1979. I submitted my petition for the degrees of Freemasonry to Calvin W. Prather Lodge number 717 at 8707 Haverstick Road in March of 2004. And from April through November, I was initiated, passed, raised, exalted, greeted, and knighted at Calvin W. Prather Lodge, number 717, Prather Chapter, number 157, Prather Council, number 100, and Trinity Commandery, number 62. The property on Haverstick Road was sold to a commercial real estate developer in 2006, and the building was leveled. A word of explanation is in order. Demolay Commandery, number 62, was chartered at Oriental Lodge, number 500, at 22nd and Central Avenue on June the 21st, 1923. The name of Demolay Commandery was changed to Oriental Commandery in 1941 in order to resolve confusion with the chapter of the Order of Demolay that was also meeting at Oriental Lodge number 500. In 1983, Lodge number 500 merged with Evergreen Lodge number 713 in the city's west side and moved out of the building at 22nd and Central. It was sold to Central Lodge number one the oldest African-American lodge in the state of Indiana, and a temple association of several Prince Hall-affiliated lodges and appended bodies moved into the building. In 1969, Oriental Commander No. 62 moved from Oriental Lodge No. 500 to Irvington Lodge No. 666 at 5515 East Washington Street. In the 1970 proceedings of the Grand Commander of Indiana, Commander No. 62 is listed as Trinity Commander. The charter was arrested in March of 1995 when Irvington Lodge number 666 folded. 
This flat iron shaped three story building was listed on the National Historic Register in 1987 and is now rented for special events. The charter was transferred to Calvin W. Prather Lodge number 717 in July of 1995, where it was added to Prather chapter number 157 and Prather council number 100, moved with Calvin W. Prather and the Prather York Ride bodies in 2006 into the building acquired from Mystic Circle Lodge number 685 at 7502 East 56th Street and rechartered as Prather Commander <clears throat> number 62 on July the 11th of 2009. With an active membership of over 200 companions and Sir Knights and having the lowest median age in the state of Indiana, the Prather York Ride bodies are able to confer all the degrees and orders in-house in full form with allegories and lectures. As a means of preserving our history, Sir Knight John Bridegroom of the Master's Craft has placed the arms of Jacques de Molay at the center of the newly created Prather Malta Jewel. And in anticipation of our centennial, he has included the date of the original charter. In 2008, I became a founding member of Levant Preceptory, a degree team that confers the Order of the Temple in period Templar dress, operating in conformance to section 260 of the Constitution of the Grand Encampment, and using as its official uniform, ceremonial robes conforming to and consistent with the historical traditions and practices of Templary. In 2015, I was appointed to serve as the Grand Master's aide and banner bearer for the 67th Knights Templar Triennium. And in 2018, I was appointed to serve on the Grand Encampment Membership Committee for the 68th Knights Templar Triennium. Having top line the petitions of 170 new Sir Knights since my own knighting in November of 2004, I was given the opportunity to collaborate with Sir Knight John Bridegroom of the Master's Craft, who is also a member of the Levant Preceptory, to create the Grand Encampment Membership Brochure with a panel that serves as a York Rite petition. My subject is the history of the Knight Templar Apron. Prior to 1717, there were Freemasons lodges in England, Scotland, and Ireland, with the earliest known admission of non-operative Masons being in Scotland. Four lodges came together at the Goose and Gridiron Ale House in London to form the Grand Lodge of London and Southern England on the Feast of St. John the Baptist on June the 24th, 1717. The Goose and Gridiron was a parody of a musician's guild called the Swan and Harp that met at the Ale House. William St. Clair of Rosslyn, the 21st Baron of Rosslyn, was elected the first Grand Master Mason of Scotland when the Grand Lodge of Scotland was formed on the Feast of St. Andrew on November the 30th, 1736, 19 years after the creation of the Grand Lodge of England. He was a direct lineal descendant of another William St. Clair, the 11th Baron of Rosslyn, who in 1446 received the charter for the construction of the Collegiate Church of St. Matthew, which was never completed, and is better known as Rosslyn Chapel. When the Grand Lodge of Scotland was not yet 12 months old, Scottish Freemason Andrew Michael Ramsey, pictured on the left, an exile living in France who was a tutor to Charles Edward Stuart, or Bonnie Prince Charlie, pictured on the right, the last of the Catholic Stuarts to lay claim to the throne of Great Britain, delivered a welcoming address that has come to be known as Ramsey's oration in a French lodge in Paris in 1737 in the course of which he explained that the Masonic Brotherhood arose in Palestine during the period of the Crusades under the protection of Christian Knights with the object of restoring Christian churches which had been destroyed by the Saracens in the Holy Land, but he made no mention of the Knights Templar. France undertook the creation of rites and degrees of Masonic knighthood, no trace of which could be found prior to Ramsey's oration in 1737. Their prototypes were the Knights of Malta, the Knights of the Holy Sepulcher, the Knights of St. Lazarus, all under papal charter, patent, or seal, and the Order of Christ under the patronage of the Portuguese crown. When the story of a secret perpetuation of the Knights Templar arose within Freemasonry, the Templar element overshadowed the pretensions of the other chivalric orders, or more correctly, it simply outshone them all. The first Masonic chivalric order to advance the story of its Templar origin was the Strict Observance, founded by Baron Karl Gotthold von Hund, pictured left and right, in Germany in 1751. 
The story goes that the ancient Templar order began in poverty, but Baldwin II, king of Jerusalem, gave them housing in the vicinity of the site where Solomon's temple had been built. Where it was, when it was put in repair by Hugh de Payon and the rest of the first brethren, their digging operations unearthed an iron casket which contained priceless treasures. Chief among them was the process of the great work in alchemy. In other words, the secret of transmuting base metals into gold as it had been communicated to Solomon by Grandmaster Hiram Abiff, and which, in the speculative sense, serves as an allegory for taking good men and making them better. Thomas Dunkerley, the illegitimate son of George II and a veteran of the British Royal Navy, was made a Freemason in 1757. He went through the three degrees of ancient craft masonry at the Lodge of the Three Tons, number 31, one of the Navy Lodges of Portsmouth, which met at the pub with the same name. In 1767, Dunkerley received the appointment to Provincial Grand Master of Hampshire, and in that position, he founded a number of naval lodges in the county. That first official appointment represented a sign of high esteem in which he was held by the Grand Lodge of England, and in particular, its royal patrons. The Prince of Wales, who was the Grand Master of the Order, the Duke of Clarence, who was the patron of the Holy Royal Arch, and Prince Edward, who was the patron of the Masonic Knights Templar Order. The Grand Lodge of England had authorized Thomas Dunkerley to revise the existing ritual, and the result was that he removed part of the third degree and gave it to the Royal Arch. He also introduced the Mark Mason degree and conferred it for the first time on the Brethren of the Portsmouth Royal Arch Chapter of Friendship number 257 in September of 1769. The earliest written record available mentioning the Knights Templar in America is to be found in the minutes of St. Andrew's Royal Arch Chapter in Boston, which was called a Royal Arch Lodge at the time. On August the 28th, 1769, Captain William Davis, for whom no image is available, a past master of British Lodge number 58 and a member of St. Andrew's Lodge, was, reading from the minutes, accepted and accordingly made by receiving the four steps, that of excellent, super excellent, royal arch, and Knight Templar. Proceeding from left to right, the second Knight Templar created in America was silversmith and engraver Paul Revere, pictured in the center who was knighted on December 11th, 1769. And the third Knight Templar created in America was physician Joseph Warren, pictured on the right, who was knighted on May the 14th, 1770. Note that this was just five years prior to the American War of Independence. William Davis proposed the barrel defense used at the Battle of Bunker Hill, which was a simple but effective tactic that consisted of barrels filled with stones and earth that were rolled down on the British Army. Paul Revere was well known for his involvement in the Boston Tea Party and was immortalized in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem about his famous midnight ride. Joseph Warren played a leading role in patriot organizations in Boston, held the title of presiding Grand Master of Massachusetts when he was created a Knight Templar and when he lost his life at the Battle of Bunker Hill. In the years following the conclusion of the American War of Independence, Thomas Dunkley proposed the centralization of the scattered Templar groups in England. On July the 24th, 1791, he informed the York Encampment of Redemption that he had been invited to assume the office of Grand Master by the Knights Templar of Bristol. York favored the proposal, and in due course, Dunkley accepted the office. The groups referred to his authority in 1791 included the observance of London, the redemption of York, the eminent of Bristol, and the antiquity of Bath. Dunkerley became the Grand Master of the first national grand conclave of the Royal Exalted Religious and Military Order, Herodom Kadash, Grand Elected Knights Templar of St. John of Jerusalem, Palestine, Rhodes, and Malta. His energy and organizational zeal contributed to the growth of the order until his death in 1795. While little has been written on the dress of the early Masonic Templars, prior to Thomas Smith Webb's Monitor of 1797, there has been one suggestion as to the origin of the Knight Templar apron. In the history of Templary of Great Britain, the following significant reference is made. 
All Templar encampments were qualified to give the degrees of the Rose Croix and the Kadash, which had existed in England as Templar degrees years before the establishment of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite. In the original form of the Templar ceremonies, the Rose Croix of Herodom was one step above the Templar installation followed by the Kadash. Rose Croix is French for Rosy Cross, but more often than not, in Masonic circles, it is pronounced Rose Croix. Herodom means the realm of heroes. Kadosh is Hebrew for holy or sacred, but more often than not, in Masonic circles, it is pronounced Kadash. The significance herein is the fact that Templary was related under British masonry to the Rose Croix and Kadash degrees. The Rose Croix apron is described as follows white, lined in black, and outlined in red. On the white side, depicting a pelican feeding her young. On the black side, a red Latin cross. In medieval Europe, the pelican was thought to be particularly attentive to her young, to the point of piercing her breast and feeding them with her own blood when no other food was available. As a result, the pelican has become a symbol of the Passion of Christ and of the Holy Eucharist since the 12th century. This imagery is perpetuated by the Scottish Rite chapter of Rose Croy. My introduction to the Knight Templar apron was made upon the occasion of my first visit to the George Washington Masonic National Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia, during the Shrine Imperial in Baltimore in July of 2005. A large portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette, the French aristocrat who was made a major general at the age of 19 in the Continental Army during the American War of Independence, dressed in a long coat and wearing a black triangular apron featuring a skull and crossbones is on display in the anteroom to Alexandria Washington Lodge number 22, which is holding under the Grand Lodge of ancient free and accepted Masons of the Commonwealth of Virginia. President James Monroe invited the Marquis de Lafayette to the United States as the nation's guest in 1824. Lafayette visited all 24 states in the Union where he was met with a warm reception. For the purposes of comparison, I have included on the left the 1824 portrait by Dutch-French painter Ari Scheffer that is on display in the U.S. House of Representatives side by side with what now appears to have been a rude copy of the original, but with two significant additions, the Knight Templar apron and a collar with what appears to be the jewel of either a Royal Arch High Priest or the prelate of an encampment of Knights Templar. According to the New York Commercial Advertiser, at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, September 11th, 1824, Lafayette, escorted by some of his Masonic brethren, attended a meeting at St. John's Hall of Jerusalem Chapter of Royal Archmasons and Morton Encampment of Knights Templar in New York, in which he was exalted and received as a member. Lafayette's secretary wrote in his diary that the Marquis and his son were present at a Masonic celebration of the Knights Templar, who conferred on them the highest dignities and gave them richly wrought insignia. It appears from other references that Morton and Columbian encampments, now commanderies, joined forces for the occasion. Thomas Smith Webb, pictured on the left, was a printer who received the three degrees of ancient craft masonry at Rising Sun Lodge in Keene, New Hampshire. On September the 14th, 1797, he published the Freemason's Monitor or Illustrations of Masonry. This small volume, which is now very rare, consisted of two parts. The second part containing an account of the ineffable degrees of masonry together with several Masonic songs written by the author. The first written standard for the Knight Templar apron was published in Thomas Smith Webb's Monitor of 1797. It should be noted that Webb was only 26 years old when this work was published. In the Monitor of 1797 and in subsequent reissues, Thomas Smith Webb includes the following in Part 1, Book 3, Chapter 3, entitled Observations on the Order of Knights Templar and Knights of Malta. Aprons, white with a black border or black with a white border, the flat black, and a skull and crossbones embroidered in silver thereon. Historically, the aprons of the craft lodge and its derivatives are rectangular in shape, while the aprons of the so-called higher degrees and the orders of Masonic knighthood are triangular. By way of example, on the left, we have the Scottish Rite 14th degree apron with the ineffable name of deity in Hebrew at its center. On the right, 
the 32nd degree apron with a symbolic representation of a Scottish Rite encampment at its center, courtesy of Red Tower Regalia in Arlington, Virginia. I have created a timeline for 18th century Freemasonry in England, Scotland, France, Germany, and the United States that lists the events that precede, coincide with, and follow one another in the relatively short span of 100 years. Rest assured, I will not be reading it to you, but I will be happy to make it available upon request. It is to Thomas Smith Webb that the first recorded standards of Masonic ritual and ceremony are attributed. Webb recast some of the degrees and completely reconstructed others. Webb's standard was accepted by the early Masonic Templars, and it was not until after the formation of the Grand Encampment in New York in 1816 and its subsequent publishing of the General Statutes of 1839 that a new design was agreed upon. In Chapter 4 of the General Statutes of the Grand Encampment of 1839, the following description of Templar dress can be found. Article 1. The costume of a Knight Templar shall consist of a full suit of black, dress coat and pantaloons, white cravat, black gloves, boots, and gilt spurs, all over a white surcoat, on the left breast of which shall be embroidered a red cross, a cross-hilted sword, the scabbard of black leather suspended from a black velvet or leather baldric, a short dagger on the left side, a black velvet apron of triangular form, having on the center a patriarchal cross, and on the flap a skull and crossbones all in silver. The edging of the aprons and collars shall be gold for grand bodies and of silver for subordinate commanderies. But there is some doubt as to the adoption of this resolution by all commanderies subordinate to the Grand Encampment. In the 1859 edition of the Craftsman and Freemason's Guide by Cornelius Moore, the apron is described as black velvet of triangular form trimmed in silver lace. On the top or flap is a triangle with 12 holes perforated through it. In the center of the triangle is a cross and serpent. On the center of the apron is a skull and crossbones. And at equal distance from them, in triangular form, a star with seven points. In the center of each, a star, uh, of each star, a red cross. And that is a more accurate description of the apron that was worn by Reverend William H. Raper of Ohio, who is pictured above. Sir Knight Raper had acquired a reputation throughout the West for the excellent manner in which he conferred the orders of Masonic knighthood. And the General Grand Encampment of the United States of America issued a charter to Raper Encampment, now Raper Commandery No. 1, in Indianapolis on October the 16th, 1850. The Grand Encampment Edicts of 1859 and 1862 made major changes in Knight Templar dress. The original edict in 1859 changed the frock coat from black to white and simultaneously abolished the wearing of the Knight Templar apron. It is challenging to locate examples of the white uniform. The figure on the left appears in reverse, but that is the nature of a woodcut print. We do have this portrait of Albert Pike, who is pictured on the right. On the left side of the frame, a river, and what appears to be the bridge that leads from Palestine to the realm of Darius the king. On one side, the Jewish banner. On the other, the Persian banner. On the right side of the frame, the banner of the illustrious Order of the Red Cross and the Grand Standard of the Order of Knights Templar. Both are topped with what the Grand Encampment calls the Patriarchal Cross, bent to one side, as they usually are, and planted in an encampment of round tents or marquees, also known as pavilions. Pike is dressed in a white knee-length frock, white leggings, a black cape lined in white, a black sash worn from the right shoulder to the left waist like a baldric, and a white belt with a passion cross on the buckle, black boots with white tassels, a black wide brim hat pinned to one side with a white plume, a sword suspended from a white frog, white gloves, but no Knight Templar apron. Although Pike is standing in front of what appears to be a commandery backdrop, he is wearing a Scottish Rite collar, prompting many observers to insist that this is a Scottish Rite Kadash costume, which only begs the question, why would Albert Pike be wearing a Scottish Rite costume in what appears to be a commandery setting? One way or the other, Pike was an enthusiastic champion of the York Rite, Templary in particular, 
who included the following in a collection of essays published in 1871 and entitled Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. One reason why you are urged to become affiliated with the York Rite is that the world is today in greater need of the Order of Knights Templar than were the heroic crusaders of the 12th century. There is more at stake, more to save. You will find in the precepts of this institution a renewed conviction that right must prevail, that oppression by any class whatsoever is wrong and incompatible with Christian thought. It still combines a religious and militant spirit and is pledged to defend those principles and ideals upon which civilization is based. The original black uniform, pictured on the left, consisted of a black military style frock coat, gloves, cuffs or gauntlets, a chapeau with a black plume, a black baldric, a black knight templar apron, with cross swords on the bib and skull and crossbones on the center and a belt, sword, and scabbard. In 1862, the Edict of, Edict of 1859 was changed to the black frock coat worn by subordinate commanderies. The revised white uniform, pictured on the right, consisted of a black military-style frock coat, gloves, cuffs or gauntlets, a chapeau with a white plume, a white baldric, a belt, sword, and scabbard, but no Knight Templar apron. A provision was made in the edicts of 1859 and 1862 to allow commanderies formed before 1859 to continue to wear the old or black uniform. But there was staunch opposition to the uniform change in commanderies where the black uniform, including the Knight Templar apron, was in use. And in an age of dirt roads and travel by horse, the white uniform was impossible to keep clean. The Grand Master's interpretation of the statute of the Grand Encampment was doubted and denied, and the order was disobeyed by most, if not all, commanders still wearing the black uniform. Prior to 1859, the clothing worn by the Knights Templar of the United States was determined only by traditional rule and consisted of black dress with the richly decorated baldric and apron. Opposition to the edicts of 1859 and 1862 was quelled by an agreement on a compromise whereby the old commanderies were to be exempted from the operation of the law. Catalog number 56, published by the M.C. Lilly and Company of Columbus, Ohio in 1890, 30 years after the widely rejected edicts of 1859 and 1862, offered no fewer than six variations of the black uniform that included the chapeau, baldric, apron, gloves, cuffs or gauntlets, belt, sword, and scabbard priced from $36.25 to $98.75. Following the conclusion of the American Civil War, fraternal societies created uniform drill teams that were outfitted in military-style frock coats, belts, swords, and scabbards, and plumed head covers. Many of these men had been in the military and enjoyed the discipline and camaraderie that a drill team provides. The Knights of Pythia Sword, which is used as the Tyler Sword in several Indiana Masonic Lodges, bears the initials UR, which stand for uniform rank, on the clam-shaped clam crossguard or quillen between two griffins. The emblem chosen for the organization was the Lily, and the uniform rank of the Knights of Pythias became known as the Army of the Lily. What distinguished the Knights Templar from other uniform fraternal societies was the baldric and the apron. Please note, a baldric is worn from the right shoulder to the left waist. A sash, on the other hand, is worn from the left shoulder to the right waist. And this information will serve you well should you become a member of the Allied Masonic Degrees or the Knight Masons. The Knight Templar baldric displays, from top to bottom, a triangle in the center of a black rosette, the Malta Cross, a nine-pointed star representing the nine original knights of the order with a cross and serpent in a, on a red background at its center encircled by the motto, In Hoc Signo Winces, a square and compass in the center of a black rosette and a dagger suspended by a ribbon. The metal fittings on the Knight Templar baldric, which were available in silver for Sir Knights and gold for eminent commanders, represent the symbolic lodge, the Royal Arch Chapter, the Order of the Temple, and the Order of Malta, which used to follow the Order of the Temple. The Knight Templar apron, 
which was trimmed in silver for Sir Knights and gold for eminent commanders, was an acknowledgement of our connection to ancient craft masonry and featured cross swords on the bib in addition to the skull and cross bones at the center. The Knight Templar apron draws its symbolism from the past to create a connection between the ancient Templar and the Masonic Templar. The black of the apron reminds us of the martyrdom of the last Grand Master Jacques de Molay. The cross swords, that we will wield our swords in defense of innocent maidens, destitute widows, helpless orphans, and the Christian religion. And the central and most striking image on the apron, the skull and crossbones, is a reminder of the mortality of the body and the immortality of the soul. Looking to the ancient past and coming full circle, the rule of the Templars outlined a detailed code of conduct governing every aspect of daily life, including clothing. The first draft was composed in 1129 and dictated 68 rules for the members of the order. Written in Latin and French over the course of 150 years, the original documents no longer exist, but they are known to us through subsequent translations. What is especially noteworthy is the claim that the ancient Templar was required to wear a sheepskin girdle about his waist at all times as a reminder of his vow of chastity. Uniform and regalia manufacturers like Frank Henderson of Kalamazoo, Michigan, who established the Frank Henderson Company in 1850, forming a partnership with Theron F. Giddings and creating the Henderson and Giddings Company in 1871, which merged with the Ames Sword Company of Chelmsford, Massachusetts in 1893 and acquired the E.A. Armstrong Regalia Factory of Detroit, Michigan, including all tools and inventories in 1894, becoming the Henderson Ames Company until the death of Frank Henderson in 1899 and continuing as the Ames Sword Company until 1931. The M.C. Lillian Company of Columbus, Ohio, founded by Mitchell C. Lilly in 1865, occupied an entire four-story building on South High Street by 1870, which the 1887 report of the State Inspector of Workshops and Factories listed as the second largest employer in Columbus with 420 employees, and later erecting a new factory at the intersection of 6th and Long Streets with a capacity for 1,500 employees, making it one of the five largest manufacturing companies in the world, purchasing the Henderson Ames Company in 1923, and the Ames Sword Company in 1925, becoming the largest sword and regalia manufacturer in the United States. By moving the Ames Sword Company tools and inventories from Massachusetts to Ohio and changing its name to the Lilly Ames Company in 1931, which was later sold 20 years later to the C.E. Ward Company of New London, Ohio in 1951. Ealing Brothers, Everhard Company of Kalamazoo, Michigan established when Otto Ealing, a 22-year-old journeyman bookbinder, moved from Milwaukee to Kalamazoo to open his new shop in April of 1869. And with his business partner, W.J. Chaplin, his brother Reinhold Ealing, and Reinhold's son, Carl Ealing, expanding into the manufacture of uniforms, costumes, regalia, and supplies. The Pettibone Brothers Manufacturing Company of Cincinnati, Ohio, whose founder, James Pettibone, took over John Boner's military goods store where he worked as a clerk in 1872 and was joined by his brother, William Pettibone, in what was described at the end of the 19th century as the large establishment in which all kinds of paraphernalia for lodges, societies, schools, etc., are manufactured and in which 450 are constantly employed. C.E. Ward Company that originated when C.E. Ward and his brother-in-law, E.R. Stilson, bought a company that made Lodge Rosettes in New London, Ohio in 1888 until C.E. Ward sold his share of the business for $50,000 to E.R. Stilson, who set out with his son and business partner, Ward Stilson, moving to Anderson, Indiana, where the Ward Stilson factory stood at 3rd and Sycamore and at one point employed more than 500 people. The proceeds from the sale of his share of the original company that made Lodge Rosettes, enabling C.E. Ward to establish his own company in New London, Ohio, on October the 2nd, 1905, later purchasing the old post office building on the corner of East Main and Railroad Avenue, installing new sewing machines and a new sprinkler system for fire protection in 1940, and acquiring the Lily Ames Company in 1951. 
Ward Stilson's business declined following World War II and the company closed in 1955. The C.E. Ward Company was purchased by Oak Hill Cap and Gown Company of Salem, Virginia in 1978, inspiring former employee Barney Thomas to launch Thomas Creative Apparel in New London, a manufacturer of choir robes, caps, and gowns, and Carl Bone, Paul Hausman, and Jim Erickson to establish an entirely separate company, New London Regalia, which has been in business since 1981, manufactured and sold Knight Templar aprons and baldrics, and Knight Templar swords with blades that were engraved with a skull and crossbones and the motto, Memento More, or Remember Death, that like the Knight Templar apron, serve as an invitation to contemplate our own mortality in the light of our knightly obligations, so that, with faith and humility, you should let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The very words of Jesus of Nazareth spoken during his Sermon on the Mount and recorded in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16. According to the C.E. Ward Company price list, effective January 1, 1958, Knight Templar aprons ranged in price from $15.40 to $19.80. Note that there were variations of the Knight Templar apron that incorporated fringe, crosses, triangles, and stars arranged in a triangular form but the one constant is the skull and crossbones in the center. Knight Templar swords range to price from $30.90 for a silver or nickel-plated sword with a wooden grip to $62.85 for a gold-plated sword with a Persian ivory grip. For the purposes of comparison, in 1958, the median annual family income was $5,000. The average price of a new car was $2,000, and the average price of a new home was $12,000. The Knight Templar apron was not merely a grim reminder of death. Witness this smiling, tuba-playing member of St. Paul Commandery of Dover, New Hampshire. Nor did it blunt the enthusiasm of the uniformed Sir Knights of Palestine Commandery No. 6 of New London, Connecticut. Note the daggers tucked into the belt of every officer, save for the prelate on the left, who has a crozier or stylized shepherd's crook at his station. The Knight Templar apron was not hidden away in the asylum, neither was it concealed from public view. On the contrary, it was worn in the company of the ladies of DeWitt Clinton Commandery No. 2 of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The Sir Knights of Columbia Commandery No. 2 from Washington, D.C. wore their Knight Templar aprons and baldrics while visiting George Washington's tomb at Mount Vernon. The Sir Knights of California and Nevada wore an elaborate variant of the black uniform, adding a richly embroidered cape and gauntlets and a wide-brimmed slouch hat turned up at the side and clasped in place with a rosette and Templar cross. Note that in the photo on the far left, the baldric is worn incorrectly, on top of the cape and from the left shoulder to the right waist. The Sir Knights of California and Nevada had their own variation of the Knight Templar apron featuring cross swords on the bib. On the center of the apron is a triangle, skull, and cross bones with embroidery, or in the case of the photo on the far left, three seven-pointed stars in a triangular form. I would be remiss if I failed to mention the fact that Prince Hall affiliated Knights Templar wore the baldric and apron, which in the photo on the left displays a paschal lamb and a cockerel or rooster on the bib, and in the photo on the right displays a triangle on the bib. I've included an illustration from the May 7th, 1884 issue of Puck, the first uh, successful humor magazine in the United States published from 1871 until 1918. Though artist Joseph Kepler was a vocal critic of the Catholic Church, he did not see much difference between Catholics and Freemasons, whom Pope Leo XIII had attacked on April the 20th, 1884, in a papal encyclical, stating in part, the Church's negative judgment in regard to Masonic Association remains unchanged, since their principles have always been considered irreconcilable with the doctrine of the Church, and therefore membership in them remains forbidden. The faithful who enroll in Masonic associations are in a state of grave sin and may not receive Holy Communion. 
The Pope is pictured on the left wielding a crozier or stylized shepherd's crook with a banner that reads, you're a humbug and you dupe the people with not one but two exclamation marks. The Sir Knight on the far right, who is wearing a baldric and Knight Templar apron, is holding in his right hand a staff with a banner that reads, you're another in all capital letters, and in his left hand, a green bottle labeled Mummery. Merriam-Webster defines mummery as ridiculous ceremonies, especially of a religious nature. One of the most prized acquisitions in my personal collection of Templar artifacts, books, catalogs, and photos is this postcard entitled, 10 Nights in a Bar Room, Postmarked Carthage, Missouri, May the 26th, 1909. See how perfectly the cartoonist has captured the details of the Knight Templar baldric and apron. But let us be clear, the Grand Commandery of Indiana hosts a dry hospitality suite at its Grand Conclave and frowns upon Sir Knights wearing their uniforms in bars, pubs, or taverns. On the other hand, Grand Encampment events feature hospitality suites that are generously stocked with top shelf wine and spirits, demonstrating the point that a dry hospitality suite is just a suite. Someone thought it was a good idea to portray Fred Flintstone in the aprons of all four York Ride bodies. Pictured from left to right, the Lodge, Chapter, Council, and Commandery. But with the passing of time, the image of the skull and crossbones fell victim to the negative associations made by uninformed members of the general public. The skull and crossbones and the motto Memento Mori disappeared from Templar swords. And, as confirmed by this illustration that appeared in the October 8, 1956 issue of Life magazine, and which remains my favorite representation of the degrees, orders, and allied organizations of American Freemasonry, the Knight Templar apron was, for the most part, and with few exceptions, no longer worn, despite the fact that the Grand Encampment has issued not one decision forbidding the wearing of the Knight Templar apron since the widely rejected edicts of 1859 and 1862. The Grand Masters of the Grand Encampment have taken the opportunity to create their own Knight Templar apron. This is the apron that was designed to be worn when attending non-uniform Masonic functions. It is a black rectangular apron bearing a purple Salem cross at the center, the Knight Templar seal on the bib, trimmed with purple velvet and embroidered in gold bullion. Question, can you wear an apron with your Knight Templar apron? Answer, it is not addressed in the Manual of Templar Jurisprudence, but the question of aprons does appear in the Digest of Approved Decisions from Grand Encampment. The decisions start with the 1940 triennial in holding that an individual or group of Sir Knights can appear in uniform without official permission. The permissions are only required for public appearances, which means organized group activities. In particular, Grand Master Orr's decision number two, dated August 20th, 1943, and approved at the 1946 triennial states in part, you have a perfect right to put on the Templar coat, covered in part with an apron, and appear with the rest of the brethren in lodge or chapter. This ruling appears to address only individuals doing so and is silent on official group appearances. When I am invited to present the York Rite three-minute drill as Masonic education in a Blue Lodge setting, I arrive in uniform, uncovered, and wearing a rectangular craft apron. When I'm introduced by the Worshipful Master, I ask him to set the lodge at rest, remove my apron, don my sword and chapeau, and move about the lodge. Antique Knight Templar aprons appear regularly on eBay, and currently there is an opportunity to purchase the entire Knight Templar kit, including a frock coat, baldric, apron, belt, chapeau, calling cards, programs, and ribbons from the 1895 Triennial in Boston for $995 on Etsy. But New London Regalia continues to offer the Knight Templar apron in silver metal with silver trim for $101, Silver medal with silver fringe for $142.25, gold medal with gold trim for $121.50, and gold medal with gold fringe for $170. All Knight Templar aprons from New London Regalia have an adjustable belt. Allow four to five weeks for delivery because they are made to order. 
While there are, in fact, cheaper imitations of the Knight Templar apron available online, this offering, for example, is available on eBay for $56, they only serve to confirm the adage attributed to John Ruskin, the leading English art critic of the Victorian era who wrote, there is nothing in the world that some man cannot make a little worse and sell a little cheaper. And he who considers price only is that man's lawful prey. But why would today's budget-minded Freemason make a $100 to $200 investment in a Knight Templar apron that is no longer required by regulation when Templary at every level was, is, and shall remain for the foreseeable future the most costly Masonic body to which one may belong? And when the Sir Knights of Indiana are already purchasing caps and mantles, frock coats and chapeaus, CPO jackets and Persian caps, and or chain mail and steel helmets? Because a new generation of Freemasons has fully embraced the more esoteric aspects of Templary. The Chamber of Reflection, which first appeared in the lodges of France in the middle of the 18th century, and is now making its way back into the traditional observance lodge. The Triangle, the Five Libations, the Ode to the Skull, and the Knight Templar Apron, which predates the military style frock coat and chapeau by not less than 100 years and is documented to have been worn in the 18th, 19th, and well into the 20th century is an acknowledgement of our connection to ancient craft masonry and to the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, who were also known as the Order of Solomon's Temple or simply the Knights Templar. I've included a list of my primary source materials listed chronologically by their date of publication. This list includes 25 publications covering five slides. Rest assured that I will not be reading it to you, but I will be happy to make it available upon request. I would also like to acknowledge the original artwork of Sir Knight John Bridegroom of the Master's Craft, who designed and produced the logo for the 2016 Bicentennial Celebration of the Grand Encampment, the committee badge for the 67th Knights Templar Triennium, the new Malta Jewel for Pray Their Commandery number 62, the Grand Encampment membership brochure, and my own personal business card. Sir Knight Sidney Lelewin of Pinworld, who designed and produced the committee badge for the 68th Knights Templar Triennium, and Gregory Stewart of Fine Art America, who created the Chamber of Reflection. Finally, I would like to acknowledge Sir Knight Ron Blaisdell, whose 1989 essay on the history of the Knight Templar apron launched me on this journey and whose personal counsel directed me to treasures heretofore undiscovered. Please send me your reviews. Your reviews will receive full attribution and be used to promote future presentations. My email address is carson.c.smith at gmail.com. I am on Facebook at carson.c.smith. All of my websites and social media are linked to my Facebook profile. I welcome your friendship and I'm happy to answer your questions. This concludes my presentation of the history of the Knight Templar Apron. All right, well, um... Thank you, uh, Sir Knight Smith, for that uh, very in-depth um, review of, of the, the history of the, of the Templar apron. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, take any questions in the Q&A. So if anybody has a question, please pose it there or the chat feature. Um, Jason, if you see any, any questions on the uh, Facebook live stream, um, please, please let us know. I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, um, throughout my Masonic experiences, I have observed that a, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, things go back to uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, um, and I and I was uh, I was Im impressed to see that uh, uh, that that portrait of him um, in that Templar apron um, um, when when Lafayette visited the uh, Mississippi Creek Nation. In southeast, uh, in the southeastern portion of the United States, he actually was personally greeted by my fourth great grandfather, Chili McIntosh of the Creek Nation. Um, so that's uh, 
that's a unique connection I have there. Uh, Carson, I had I had one question. Um, you made mention of uh, Persian ivory grips, mm -hmm. the Templar swords. Now, is is Persian ivory is that is that just standard ivory or is that a name for an ivory imitation? You know, I, I've I've tried to get an answer to that question. I have several uh, swords that have what look like ivory. I I'm, I'm comparing it with the piano that sat in my, my grandmother's living room and the, the appearance of the keys. I don't know if it's actual ivory taken from the tusk of a, a slain elephant or if it's simply a bone handle. I can't find any confirmation of what Persian ivory actually is because it's not offered anymore. Um, I can tell you this. I always tell any young Sir Knight who wants to buy a sword, don't buy a new sword because the new swords are uh, made without the original tooling. The moldings on the scabbard are made using lost wax casting. So they tend to look like bad Xerox copies of bad Xerox copies. What you want to do is buy an old sword on eBay and send it to New London and have them rename and replate it. And if you have an ivory handle, make sure you specify that you get it back. Otherwise, they disappear. Interesting. Are there any other questions? I, I have either lost you or nailed it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not seeing any. Jason, what about yourself? Uh, I'm not seeing. We, we have a, a few comments on Facebook. Um, any worth sharing? Any, any we want to share? Well, I will share uh, from Most Worshipful Robert Davis, a uh, well-done presentation on regalia history. You know, that's the part of this this presentation that I, I've really enjoyed is is the regalia manufacturers. Um, usually I, I tell people in advance, you know, get out your swords and get ready to turn uh, turn the blade over and see uh, the marking at the uh, at the grip, because uh, there was a, a great industry in the Midwest in particular that churned out uh, Masonic uh, uniforms and swords. And uh, I love the fact that these companies in, in, in their time were some of the largest manufacturers in the world, and then they just disappeared uh, following World War II. Um, I'll, I'll add to that, uh, Carson, because I've, you know, I've had a lot of things come through my hands and, 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 and seen a lot of different uh, regalia pieces by different manufacturers. And in particular with, with swords, um, a lot of Sir Knights will say, well, what, you know, ask me, what time period do you think this is from? And if you look at the, the maker of the sword and the name, and you can typically Google the time frames that mm -hmm. uh, those manufacturers were using specific names and you can nail down um, periods of manufacture pretty well if you don't have any other sort of archival information on the individual. So. That, that's especially true with the MC Lillian company. Uh, every time there was a change in their ownership or management, they would change the name of the company. So it would be MC Lilly, MC Lillian company, the MC Lillian company, Lilly Ames. Uh, so that is a great way to at least narrow it down to decades. A lot of people make the mistake is they'll pick up the scabbard and they'll see a, a like a number 90 stamped in the scabbard. Oh, well, this is made in eight, or sub, yeah, 1890. No, it wasn't. That's just the model number. Um, it's the name on the blade that will give you a better idea of what year it was made in. Uh, we do have one one question here from Rick Smith, um, and he he states uh, the Ames Sword Company. It appears to be of a finer quality. Is there a preference to ivory or black handle swords with a state's commandery? And is there any literature available on the Ames Sword Company? Yes, uh, I, I, I do have a printed history of the Ames Sword Company. So, and I, I'll make this offer to everyone. If anybody wants a copy of my timelines, my bibliographies, um, I have links to, to the histories of specific sword companies. I have a lot of wonderful graphics that don't exist anywhere else, so far as I know. You, you have to know going in that, that uh, as I said at the beginning, I, my whole motivation in becoming a Freemason in 2004 was I wanted to become a Knight Templar. And I've um, made it my regular habit to go to eBay to look for all these wonderful treasures that families and commanderies have just put on market because they don't know what to do with them. Um, a lot of these pictures that I've posted are, are mine alone. I, I bought them on eBay auctions. Um, and they don't you can't find them using a Google search. Um, likewise, the, the, the postcard that I'm so fond of, that was purchased on eBay. Um, but, but we're losing so much of our history because people don't know what it, or I always love it when commandery jewels are sold as uh, Civil War uh, medals. No, they're not, but nice try. 
Um, so yeah, a lot of the things I have are entirely original. If you have a copy of the book, um, The Compass is in the Cross uh, by Stephen Dafoe uh, from Canada, uh, a lot of the illustrations he, uh, he included were uh, from, quote, uh, the Carson C. Smith collection. <laughs> so yeah, I have a lot of original stuff that you won't find anywhere else. And those to get some very lovely images as well. Um, and and to um, to come back to, to Rick's question, he um, as far as as black handle swords versus white handle swords. Oh, was that just a was that just a, a decision by the, the that jurisdiction as to what they would carry? Because you know, for example, today Arkansas still wears black all black right. plumes, whereas Oklahoma. Um, we wear white plumes with a black under plume. Right. And then what, what would be the difference between the white and black handled swords? Well, well here, here's, here's what you have to understand going into this. Uniform regulations are controlled by the state. So whatever your grand commander says is your official uniform, that's what you have. Uh, in most, most jurisdictions, and as far as I know, I, I don't know of any exceptions to this, current Sir Knights who have not yet attained the East in their commanderies carry a sword with a black handle and silver trim. Once you become an eminent commander, you have the privilege of purchasing a gold sword with a white handle. Uh, the white handles today are made from Delrin. Uh, they're not ivory, of course. Um, uh, I've also seen them made with porcelain. Um, but uh, but no, it, all, all of your uniform regs are controlled by state jurisdiction. Now, if you want a real treat, uh, go to the Easter celebration in Alexandria, Virginia. You will be amazed by the variety that you'll see uh, in Templar uniforms by state. Uh, one of the most shocking things I saw was, was a Sir Knight who uh, carried a sword uh, up the hill. And instead of feeding the frog for the sword through the pocket of the CPO jacket, which most of us do, he'd actually opened up the side seam and pushed the frog through a hole that he made in the side of the jacket, which I don't understand because actually it puts the sword behind you. But uh, you'll see a lot of variations. As for Arkansas, uh, I'll be presenting to a body in Arkansas in a couple of weeks. And their problem is, is that the black... Uh, Ostrich plumes are very hard to acquire. In fact, all of the ostrich plumes are hard to acquire because uh, people are eating ostriches now. So you have to get the big plumes from a very mature ostrich, and consequently, it comes with a premium. You um, you raised you raised an excellent point there about uh, the variations in, in regalia. Um, when I was writing my my book, uh, Nights on the Prairie, at the History of Templar in Oklahoma, um, in in early early Oklahoma, they uh, there was a complaint that uh, past commanders were buying um, fanciful uniforms that did not adhere to the uh, to the right. state regulations. Um, right. In Oklahoma, at one point, you could find regalia from from Kansas. Um, Missouri, Arkansas, and Texas all, all in one place. There was uh, right. an incredible variation. And, and I even own a sword um, that belonged to a, a past grand commander from the 1920s. And it is an Iowa regulation sword, not an Oklahoma right. regulation sword. So. Well, and, and if you, if you want a, a great summary of what sword belongs in which state reg, if you go to the New London Regalia um, website, they actually list all of the swords that they still make available and they will show you uh, which sword is quote unquote regulation for which state. Now in Indiana, because we're in a, uh, the center of the country and because these swords travel the length and breadth of our, 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 our country, um, we'll allure, uh, allow just about any sword um, to be worn um, in, in a, a commandery of, of, of Knights Temple in the state of Indiana. The only difference is, is that if you're going to be a member of a drill team, you can't have the chain on the grip. That's considered to be an unfair advantage uh, intended to keep you from dropping the sword. And a lot of points have been taken from drill teams for people dropping their swords in the middle of the drill. Mm -hmm. So again, if you have a sword with a chain, you're going to have to take that chain off or you're going to take it on a drill floor. Very, very interesting. So, well, I think that uh, that probably concludes our, our questions and comments for the day. So uh, we appreciate you being available this morning. I, again, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. I'm sure everyone else did. Jason, do you have any any comments or remarks or uh, any announcements on upcoming uh, presentations? Only, only that uh, <clears throat> I encourage you to stay tuned. The, uh, the uh, presentation from or uh, May will be uh, announced very soon. 
and uh, trying to get the details worked out. And um, if you've attended today, uh, you'll be one of the first ones to get an invitation to that. If I may, uh, shameless plug, another uh, a presentation that I'm giving that people really enjoy is uh, Freemasonry in Rosslyn Chapel. If I do my job correctly, by the time I reach the end of it, you'll be equally disappointed and equally delighted. We, we, again, Carson, we, we thank you for, for, uh, for being here today, and, and I thank all of our attendees. So um, with that, I think we can, we can call it a morning. So, Thank you so very much. Thanks again, Carson. Yes, please be in touch. Thank you, Jason.